So we're continuing our discussion on neuropathic pain management in dogs and cats uh, and talking about the NMDA receptor antagonists and specifically ketamine, amantadine and mamantine. And you can see from the molecular structure here that two of them are very similar to each other um, and have a similar mechanism of action. And the other ketamine is quite uh, different and has, although a, uh, still acting at the level of the NMDA receptor, has a different mechanism of action. Now, these are not your first line therapy drugs, which is probably gabapentin, or your second line, which is probably pregabalin. And there are some videos of that if you want more details. These are more the third or perhaps fourth line therapy agents. So when things are starting to get a little bit more uh, difficult and perhaps may even be combined with those first and second line agents. The first one we're going to talk about is ketamine, um, which is either used uh, periodically or as a one off infusion. Ketamine is the classic uh, NMDA receptor, the one that we're most familiar with. Uh, it reduces wind up at the level of the dorsal horn and therefore reduces central sensitization. And in case you're not uh, very familiar with that, we're going to go over that very quickly. But there's also another video on neurobiology of neuropathic pain, which may be of interest to you. So first of all, we have release of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate from the C fibers and uh, uh, alpha delta fibers and also substance P. Substance P binds to the neurotachykinin receptor and the glutamate binds to the AMPA receptor. If there's enough pain, then eventually enough binding of that results in an action potential. And if there is enough um, uh, action potential, then there is loss of the magnesium block. This is a very specialized receptor, the NMDA receptor, which is blocked by magnesium under normal circumstances. This allows the glutamate to then bind to the NMDA receptor and the process of wind up and central sensitization occurs. What ketamine, however, does is binds to that glutamate binding site and blocks that receptor. So if ketamine come along, bind to that site um, and, uh, and then uh, glutamate cannot bind. Ketamine also has many other actions. It's anti-inflammatory. It increases dopamine. It blocks the 5,2-H2 serotonin receptors and helps restore uh, spinal cord inhibition generally. Uh, so it it's, uh, can be very useful in a number of conditions which involve wind up, not just neuropathic pain, but also uh, um, epilepsy, specifically status epilepticus and also depression in, in humans. So we're talking about using it occasionally or uh, monthly, um, and it's usually a low dose of ketamine, not your uh, anesthetic quality of, uh, of ketamine and not the dose that would re um, result in tripping or um, uh, euphoria. The, the unusual thing about ketamine, it has a benefit way beyond the duration of the drug. So this effect on wind up. Uh, but is uh, longer than the, the duration of the drug. And so what I do in animals that are extremely painful, have a chronic pain condition um, and are having an acute exacerbation of their pain. For example, uh, dogs with Chiari-like malformation associated pain and syringomyelia can go through periods where they're uh, acutely much worse. Then I'll give them what I call a, a ketamine holiday. And this is a CRI of ketamine. Uh, it's a 12 or preferably 20, 48 hour infusion. Um, uh, it, you start with a bolus dose. And again, that's that's a much lower dose than you would give for anesthesia. And then you can you continue that as um, a, a, as an infusion, a CRI. Uh, in humans, they give that with a magnesium infusion and perhaps a uh, not what you'd think, but magnesium increases the ketamine's binding uh, affinity. The longer the infusion, the more the sustained response. And this has only been determined in humans, but in humans, a 100 hour infusion gives four to eight weeks of relief and 12 to 24 hour gives um, uh, gives seven days, uh, seven to 10 days. Uh, ketamine is highly lipophilic, so it's absorbed well into the brain. 
uh, and it's metabolized by the liver and it's excreted whole and, and it's metabolized by the, the, the kidney. So you do have to pay attention to the animal's general organ function when you're giving it. But on the whole, that it can be a lot safer than some of the other alternatives that there are for animals in severe pain. Another way that it's used is by giving it um, IM or subcutaneously intermittently. So, for example, uh, once every month. Uh, and this dosing regime is, is simply by uh, convenience. It's much more convenient for an animal to come in and have a subcutaneous dose of um, ketamine and go away again afterwards than it is for it to come in for a, a, a hospitalization. And it's also much um, uh, uh, cheaper. Now, this is a, a sixth to a tenth of the dose of anesthesia, so the animal shouldn't have adverse effects from this. Um, however, if it's certainly if it's the first time, then I normally don't just give the injection and have them walk straight out the door. I normally have the owners wait half an hour, even in the, in the waiting room with their animal, just to make sure they're not having any adverse effects. And likewise, depending on the effect of the animal, I may gradually in that animal increase to, to one uh, milligram per kilogram. That should be said, there's been no studies done on this. And probably the, the people who've been doing it the most uh, Matt Gurney um, uh, from the Zero Pain Philosophy website, and I'd advise you to check out that website as well if you're interested in doing this. Now, I use ketamine for central neuropathic pain, um, uh, and that's just because ketamine has a central action. If you're talking about once monthly therapy for peripheral neuropathic pain, then it may be more appropriate to use uh, the uh, anti nerve growth factor drugs, uh, Labrella and Silencia. Uh, depending on when you are listening to this, maybe there'll be other tr trade names uh, available for those drugs, but that's what they're known as now. Now, bear in mind, these drugs are licensed for osteoarthritis in the dog and the cat, but uh, hypothetically, they should work for other peripheral uh, uh, neuropathic pain conditions. And certainly I do use them off license in that uh, in that uh, um, scenario. In humans, um, ketamine uh, given every uh, uh, in this way is also has an antidepressant effect, which is important to bear in mind in uh, uh, neuropathic pain because it will activate those limbic centers and does have an impact on animals mental health. So uh, a lot of owners do. Um, uh, report their animal seems much brighter after ketamine and sometimes I wonder if it's the antidepressant effect. In humans it's for this it's also given orally where it has a very very low bioavailability or intranasally which has a much higher bioavailability and I mention that only because that actually would be the best means uh, which to give uh, ketamine uh, if there wasn't so many legal uh, issues associated with prescribing it that way, uh, just simply because the intranasal route will go straight to the brain via the olfactory uh, nerves and the lymphatic system. So our next NMDA receptor antagonist are mantidine or mamantine. Um, so because they're acting at the level of the um, NMDA receptor, they have a similar action. So um, we have that action potential and we have loss of the magnesium block. But in this circumstance, what amantadine and uh, mamantine do is they actually have this very uh, complex three ring structure, uh, which I've created here in these models, which actually bridge the uh, ma magnesium binding site. So they block it in that way rather than the glutamate receptor. And actually, uh, for those who have the question is, yes, you can use low dose amantine and mamantine together, uh, um, low dose ketamine and amantine and mamantine together. However, I do obviously uh, advise you monitoring the dog for potential adverse effects in that instance. So um, amantadine uh, is the one we're probably more familiar with. It potentiates uh, dopamine uh, neurotransmitter as well as being an NMDA receptor antagonist as a very mild anti-Parkinsonian 
effect, but it's not used for treating Parkinson's disease, uh, except if all other drugs aren't working. It also has a, a mild anticholinergic activity, uh, which it's suggested also to have an antidepressant effect. It's an antiviral drug, but it's no longer recommended as that use because of widespread uh, resistance to it in the influenza virus. And there is talk of it being restricted to only human use in, in the EU, so it may become very unavailable. Uh, this is the dose, three to five milligrams per kilogram every 12 to 24 hours. Uh, most animals require every 12 hours and you need to have at least three weeks therapy to assess uh, uh, effect on neuropathic pain. Obviously, if they're having adverse effects, don't go on for that long. But bear in mind, you're in for the long haul when you give this drug. It's not just a case of popping them a few amantadine. Um, and uh, uh, certainly that's one of the reasons why this should be a third or a fourth line agent, because you're going to have to give a much longer trial of it. Potential adverse effects, sedation, ataxia, gastrointestinal signs and an overdose you're, you may see um, agitation, tremors and hypersalivation. Uh, the, this drug is often given in combination with some of the other neuropathic pain drugs like pregabalin, and so you may be much more likely to see those uh, potential adverse effects. Um, when you monitor it, you need to adjust the dose based on efficacy and adverse effects. You need to reduce the dose if they have significant kidney disease, and I always monitor by uh, giving a pre and um, therapy, haematology and serum biochemistry, and then may, uh, monitor those periodically. Some of you won't have heard of amantine again, and there's actually no information on this drug uh, uh, for neuropathic pain in dogs and very poor evidence in, in humans, a very small effect, and the adverse effects of dizziness make it a very unpopular drug to use. So why am I talking about it? Well, um, basically, it's much, much cheaper than amantadine, uh, which if, um, is, can be really quite eye-wateringly expensive sometimes, especially if you're using it in larger animals. Uh, whereas this one comes in 5 to 10 and 20 milligram tablets, and so it can be much cheaper um, than amantadine. And also, actually, it has more affinity with the NMDA receptors compared to amantadine. They both have this three-dimensional tricyclic structure, and the monitoring is as for amantadine. So I hope that's giving you some background information on those drugs. In future videos, we're going to talk about specifically when uh, I would use these drugs over others. Bye bye.